All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> what a, what a, what a, I'm still got that in my head. I don't know why I say that. good morning. I'm just going to stop saying good whatever, you know. <laughs> good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good to be with you tonight. Good to be back doing the devotions. Thank you for <clears throat> your patience. Thank you for... Um, Thank you for your prayers and all that in regards to the old voice doing a lot better now. So uh, appreciate that. But excited to get back into it. So I uh, hope and pray that you're looking forward to that. I um, <clears throat> hope and pray you had a great day yesterday in church. And uh, hey, John, good evening. John and Bronwyn, good evening. I hope you had a great day in church yesterday, folks, uh, wherever it was that you worshipped. hope and pray that all was good. Jean, good evening. And uh, I'm grateful for our church. I love our church and uh, just excited about what God is doing. Loren, good evening. Pond family, good evening. <coughs> excuse me, very, excuse me. Got to get the old frog out of the way. Um, yeah, we had a great day yesterday. Excited about what God was doing. I was praising God at um, that young lady, Kayla, getting saved on the way to church. Praise God for that, man. And then, of course, we had Clarence visiting with us yesterday who said he was coming back. Judy, good evening. So we had a great, I believe we had a great day all around, but then I could be a little bit biased. <laughs> no one to be that. All right, let's get into it tonight. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke. And um, I'm reading through Luke, as I had said to, to our folks on Sunday, I'm reading through Luke and uh, enjoying that. There's so much, I mean, all the Gospels are really good, but... Um, you know, Luke, to me, just sort of just hits the ground running with, with a number of different things. And um, you read the, uh, you know, the first couple of chapters of the Gospel of Luke, Sue Ellen, good evening, uh, so filled with the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit in the life of uh, uh, John the Baptist when he was in the womb, in the life of uh, Mary, obviously, uh, in the life of Zacharias and Elizabeth, in the life of Simeon. The Holy Spirit was just working and doing a, a great move of God in the lives of these people. I get so jealous when I read that because I too long for the moving of the Spirit of God, and perhaps He is, I'm sure He is, doing a work in, in our lives and in our church and um, just excited. Luke is an amazing Amazing book. Of course, when he starts out, he's written writing to a guy called Theophilus. And I reckon Theophilus is a man of means. I think he's a man of importance because he calls him excellent Theophilus, most excellent Theophilus. I think he was a some sort of dignitary. And uh, Luke was setting forth the things that he had seen and it was writing down and just sharing with Theophilus. And uh, the, the first thing that Luke jumps into is the life of of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And I would like to read a few verses about that tonight and then we'll get into it. I'll give you the idea, the thought uh, for it. And we pick it up in verse number five, if you want to have a listen. It says, There were in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. I just want to stop there and just make a brief comment about something. Here we have a couple who married within their circle. Zacharias was a priest. Uh, Elizabeth was of the, 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 the lineage of Aaron. It was the priest of the Levitical priesthood. And brethren, though this is a topic all of its own, there is something to be said, Brother Clive, good evening. There is something to be said about making sure you marry within your circle. You know, we talk about not being unequally yoked, and we shouldn't. I don't believe a Christian should marry a non-Christian in the hope of leading that non-Christian to the Lord. I think that's dangerous grounds to be on. But I have also seen, I've also seen uh, brethren who are of the Baptist faith marry someone who is of a Pentecostal persuasion, and it just didn't work. All right? I'm not saying that it never works. I'm just saying it, it, you've got to be careful. But what I notice about these two is they married within their circle, and I think that's important to point out, all right? Verse 6, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, 
According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Um, let me just stop and say this too. Um, his lot was to burn incense. That's not a big job. I mean, you know, you light a few incense, you get those things burning. But the key is this, Brother Michael Newby, good evening. The key is this. It doesn't matter the size of the job you do for God as long as you do it well. Okay. So he may not have had a real upfront sort of whatever. His lot was to burn incense and that was his job. But he carried it out faithfully. All right. Verse 10, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall Bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Thy prayer is heard. We have a phenomena in the world today, and it, 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 it stems across both the unsaved kingdom as well as the saved kingdom. The phenomena is quitting. Quitting. It's very easy to quit on things today. People quit on things regularly. People quit their job. And, uh, you know, they might talk themselves into saying, well, you know, this job doesn't fit me. It's not suited to me. And, uh, you know, I just, oh, I just not enjoy it. So they up and quit. Or the boss gets upset with them, rakes them over the coals. Man alive, I tell you what, when I was a young fella in the workforce, wow, I had bosses that would just tear you to shreds. Now, if a boss gets upset with a worker, the worker's like, oh, I can't, I'm not standing for this. I have my rights. I'm quitting. Off they go. They quit jobs. People quit jobs all over the place. Perhaps there are those of you who have quit a diet before. <laughs> you, just, you had great intentions. Man, I need to lose a few kilos. And uh, this is what I'm going to start the carnivore diet, or I'm going to start the keto diet, or I'm going to start this diet. And you get about two weeks into it, you don't see anything happening, it's not happening fast enough, and you quit. You quit on it. There are many we could talk for ages about people who have quit going to church. Oh, they've got their excuses, and I'm sure, I'm sure, Sasha, good evening, I'm sure that there are people out there who, you know, they quit because of some sort of wrongdoing. Even with that in mind, I don't think you should tar every church with the same brush and just quit on it. And I understand it. But we have a problem in the world today, and that is people quitting church. You know, uh, the, the pastor didn't congratulate me, or the pastor didn't shake my hand, or sister... Mildred sat in my chair or brother Rob didn't do this and didn't do that and so on and the list goes on and on. I'm not going back there anymore. I'm quitting. And of course, unfortunately, we know of instances where both men and women have quit their marriage. It's a very sad day where marriages aren't treated like they should be. So easy today just to quit on something. And of course, we've got the various reasons. And quitting becomes easier and easier the more you do it. Here we have a couple, Zacharias and Elizabeth, who could have very easily just up and quit. What I want to talk to you tonight is on this thought, don't quit on God because he won't quit on you. Don't quit on God because he won't quit on you. And as I said, we've got this couple here, probably high school sweethearts stemming all the way back to their high school days there in Galilee or Nazareth. They went to the local high school down there and one day uh, Elizabeth caught Zacharias's eye from across the hall there and he was, he was taken. He was smitten, this beautiful young lady. And they became high school sweethearts. And uh, they grew together and then got married. They had been married for a very long time by this time that Luke is writing. 
But the problem was, was that Elizabeth couldn't have children. And as I said on Sunday, to have children, regardless of whether it was in Bible times or even in our day today, having children is a blessing. It's the fruit of the womb. It's a wonderful thing. God ordained it. God organized it. God blesses it. So for a lady not to be able to have children, that was a very difficult circumstance to handle. I see Elizabeth walking down the street, perhaps past her local childcare center. She sees the mums just wheeling or taking their babies into the daycare and perhaps she even stops and observes. Maybe she even walks up to a pram and looks into that little pram and sees that bundle of joy there and just, just dotes over that thing and just longingly, prayerfully desires, oh God, why can't I have a child? And she turns her back to walk away. Perhaps she walks away to the, uh, the, 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 the jeers or the, the under-the-breath comments of, there goes Elizabeth. She's barren. She can't have kids. You don't know what's wrong with her. And off she walks, discouraged, dejected. Now, the scriptures don't say that, but we know what life is like. We know what people are like. And when someone desires something so much, like a child, it becomes hard when you can't have one. Perhaps Zacharias has gone down to the local IGA to buy some things at the local IGA. And as he's standing there in line to pay for his kosher meal and, you know, his... Uh, his uh, uh, Coke, no sugar, and um, you know all those wonderful things. Perhaps he's getting a picnic and a Kit Kat, Kit Kat for uh, Elizabeth. And as he's standing there, some of the men from the town walk up to him and uh, say, uh, "Hey, Zacharias, what's going on? How come you don't have any children? What's the matter? Is Elizabeth the problem? Are you the problem? What's going on? How come you, you're not fathering? It's important that your name continues on. You must have a lineage, Zacharias. What's going on? And perhaps." He leaves the local IGA dejected because his manhood is, has been trodden underfoot, called into question, wanders home dejected and discouraged. Again, the scriptures don't say that, but you know, it's like it's, it could be something that, that might happen. So I would say that if we were to talk about anybody perhaps quitting, it could be that uh, perhaps even Zacharias and Elizabeth might have had opportunity just to quit on God, but they didn't quit. They didn't quit on God. They had prayed for a child. We know that because the scripture says that the angel Gabriel says, for thy prayer is heard. Thy prayer is heard. Now, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Perhaps they've been praying all their married life together. Maybe even before they were married, while they were courting, they were praying that God would bless them with a wonderful family. And as they started out on their marriage life, and as Elizabeth couldn't get pregnant, they prayed the more earnest. They prayed and they prayed. Maybe they got to a point in their life where they said, well, you know, Elizabeth, you're too old now. Let's just stop praying. Obviously, it's not of God. We don't know. Perhaps they prayed right up until this very point in time, drawing upon the inspiration of ladies in the scripture like Sarah, Rachel, or even Hannah, who had children uh, for Sarah in her old age. Sarah might have been the pin-up lady for Elizabeth, because we know that Sarai, Sarah had a child in her late stage of life. Nevertheless, they, they prayed about it. Have you ever been praying about something and you didn't think your prayers were being heard and you just quit praying for it? Perhaps you have been drawing upon the inspiration of uh, Bible characters and you said, God, God, you did it for them. Do it for me. And you, and you were claiming and claiming the promises and praying and claiming and and a month down the track, nothing's happening and you just quit praying. Maybe even a year down the track, you were still praying, nothing's happening and you just quit praying. Regardless of how long they were praying or how long they weren't praying, Gabriel was sent and he said, thy prayer is heard. What an encouraging word that is to know 
that the prayer has been heard. It's a blessing, isn't it, to know that God hears our prayer. Why would God wait so long? Why would God allow a couple to go through basically their whole life together without children? In the springtime of their life, when everything's new and, and, and that was the time to have children. The midday of life when they're middle-aged, possibly still able to have children, but no, no children. Now they're in the twilight of their life. Why does God wait so long? There's always a purpose. Jesus waited four days before he raised Lazarus from the dead. Why did he wait four days? Why does God wait so long? I do believe the reason why he waits so long, and because we put time frames to it with God, it doesn't bother him. He's not bound by time. We gauge everything by time. Perhaps God waits so long because there's a greater miracle, a greater display of his power. It as I said, it, the, the early life, the early stages of life when, when, when couples are having children, it's no brainer, no brainer. But once you pass a certain age, like Sarah and Abraham, uh, says of Abraham that he was almost dead, almost dead. <laughs> he, was just, he was well past being able to have kids and same with Sarah. And then bang, God miraculously gives them a child. And same with Zacharias, thy prayer is heard, regardless of whether they're praying in the early stages of their life or whether they're praying all through their life, right up until Zacharias went to work that day. Maybe they were praying right up to, hey, but either way, God waited because there was a greater purpose and a greater display of power. Sort of begs the question for us, are we willing to wait? <laughs> willing to wait. Willing, are we willing to wait knowing that God has a greater purpose? You know, more often than not, as I said, when we don't get our prayers answered according to our time frame, we say, oh, God said no. Well, maybe God hasn't said no. Maybe there's just that wait time. Maybe there's a waiting period that God expects us just to wait on him. But... They didn't quit on God. He said, well, how do you know that? Well, because of what they continued to do. And listen, we shouldn't quit on God because God doesn't quit on us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He hears the prayer. He sees the heart. He knows what you're going through. He, he, he sees everything. And he perhaps is just waiting for that perfect time for him to do something. I know they didn't quit on God because they didn't quit their walk with him. Look at it at verse number, uh, verse number six. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. I've known people to quit on God for lesser. But here is Zacharias and Elizabeth. Yes, they, in their eyes, now they didn't have the benefit of Scripture, but in their eyes, perhaps God was not going to give them a child. They had resigned, perhaps they resigned themselves to being childless. But you know what really impresses me, more so probably impresses God, that's more important, was the fact that they kept walking with him. I'm wondering what it takes in our life to quit on God and stop walking with him. You know, it says that they were both righteous before God. They did what was right, despite the fact that they were childless. They did right. They didn't say, oh, what's the use? We prayed. God doesn't hear our prayer. He doesn't pray. We're just going to go and do our own thing. Many a believer has done that before. No, they kept walking 
with him. And folks, that's a key. When things seemingly, and I say seemingly, when things seemingly are not going your way, don't quit on God, keep walking with him. Keep walking with him. Because it's during the times where we look at things, Robert and Rachel, good evening. It's during those times, uh, happy anniversary to you both too. We've been praying for you and your daughter and your granddaughter. It's during those times where things are difficult. And as I said, we don't know what Elizabeth and... Uh, we know that she was a reproach to men. The scriptures say that. We don't know. She might have walked out the doors each morning to go and do what she had to do, perhaps go and collect water down by the well, run into all the other ladies that are there. <coughs> and while she's drawing water from the well, she, she catches the, the sideway glances of the other ladies in the city knowing what they've been talking about, knowing what the, uh, the, they've been thinking about, it would have been very easy to stop going to church. It would have been very easy to quit on God. But they didn't. They were righteous before God and they kept walking with him. Secondly, they didn't quit on God because they kept serving him. Verse 7, they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they both were now well stricken in years. Not just old, they were well stricken. Came to pass that while he executed the priest's office, before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Again, not a great big job that he was tasked with. You know, he wasn't tasked with some of the other priestly jobs. But nonetheless, what he did was Important because the incense, the people were standing outside and as the incense was going up, they would pray. And the Bible talks a lot about the incense going up, the prayers of the saints going up. It was an important job. And we know that they didn't quit on job, on God because they kept serving him. Despite the fact that Zacharias would have thought, well, there goes my name. It's not going to be passed on. My, I'm not going to have a lineage. I'm not going to have whatever. And who knows? But maybe in the back of his mind, he had even thought of maybe taking a second wife just so that he could have had children. Happened before. But nonetheless, he still kept serving God to the best of his ability. Brethren, can I say to you, as I said before, when things are seemingly going awry and prayers are seemingly not being answered, don't quit on God by stopping serving him. I uh, caught up with young Zach today, had a lunch with Zach today. And uh, we had a great time. And, and he was just praising the Lord. It blessed my heart. He was just praising the Lord at open door because it's the only church where he's served God in. And, and I, I believe he's going he's gonna to come back and after he's rested a little bit and, and, and keep serving. But he was very encouraged, excited and thankful for a place to be able to serve. You know, when we come to church and there's open door and other churches, we're not big churches, but there's always something someone can do. And we've got to get it out of our head by, by, by grading different things as, oh, that's a big job and that's a little job. Any job for Jesus is a big job. Kim, good evening. So they didn't quit on God because they didn't stop serving him. But then we got out of the blue comes this angel and says, thy prayer is heard. Wow, that would have been, <laughs> what now? <laughs> When I'm, I don't know, who knows how old they were, 90, 95, I don't know, they were well stricken in years. What, Lord, now I'm having a child? I'll be honest with you, I'm 55, I don't want any kids. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want any babies. Change, changing Judah's nappy, wet nappies or pooey nappies or whatever it is. I'm, I'm over all of that. I don't want any more kids. Going through the whole schooling thing and so on and so forth. No thanks, no thanks. And here's Zacharias. Your prayer has been heard. You're going to have a child. Woo, glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's an important verse in this whole scenario here that really is the basis of why 
we shouldn't quit on God. Yes, he doesn't quit on us, we know that. But notice something that the Bible says when Gabriel was talking to Mary. Verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. That's what she was called. There's barren. (laughs) There goes barren. Verse 37, This is the basis of why we should not quit on God. For with God nothing shall be impossible. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. That's the very basis of why we keep going. That's the very foundation of why we keep praying and keep serving and keep loving. And that's the base. For with God, nothing, nothing shall be impossible. God likes to take the things that with men are impossible, but not with God. Go with me to the Gospel of Mark, if you would. Gospel of Mark, and which is what he says here in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus was talking to the disciples about rich people getting saved. He says, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to get saved. Peter was somewhat perplexed by that. Verse 26 of chapter 10 of Mark. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? Jesus, looking upon them, said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Not just in the context of salvation. We know that salvation with God is not impossible. He saves the sinner. But notice Jesus said, All things are possible. Not just saving a rich person, but that all things encompasses, here it is, all things. (laughs) With God, all things are possible. You know, brethren, you and I serve, love, and pray to the God who is able to do the impossible. As a matter of fact, go back a chapter to... Chapter 9, there was a man who had a demon-possessed son and brought him to his disciples and they couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't cast him out. And and the dad was pretty upset by that, as you can imagine, I would be. I'd take my son to the the local church and talk to the pastors and, can you help me? No, we don't know what to do. I, I would be upset. Jesus starts questioning the man in verse 21. He asked of his father, how long is it ago since this came under him? He said of a child and oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire, into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now, brethren, it's one thing to know, to recognize, to realize that God is able to do the impossible. It's another thing for you and I to believe God for that which is impossible. We read it time and time again. Every time we read through our Bible, we read about this God of the impossibilities. Every time we read that, we see what Jesus was doing to those who were struggling, the blind, the outcast, the deaf, the dumb, the leprous, and all those sorts of things. And we read and we see and we hear everything that Jesus did. And we've heard message after message about the God of the empire. He maketh a way in the wilderness. He maketh a way in the dry ground and through the sea. He maketh a way. And we hear it and we hear it. But do we believe it? Because all things are possible. To him that believeth. I was reading Jude the other day. Not a big book, obviously. (laughs) You can read it in one sitting. But I came to this passage. And we could go to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. But I read this and it was such a blessing to me. In verse number 24, it says, Now unto him that is able. Unto him that is able. You know, our God is able. Our God is able. Rest of this verse in Jude says to keep thee from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I'm glad he's able to do that. More than that, there is a limitless range 
to God's abilities. He is able. He is able to take someone like Zacharias and Elizabeth, who are now well stricken in years, prayed for a child. Perhaps they stopped. Perhaps they kept going. The angel come and says, thy prayer has been answered. Elizabeth is going to have a child. For with God, nothing is impossible. Brethren, don't quit on God because God won't quit on you. It's important for us to know that. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and your blessing to us. We thank you that you are the God of impossibilities. And we love you for that. Thank you for this example of Zacharias and Elizabeth. Bless the remainder of our evening in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. Thank you for joining tonight. I appreciate that. Have a good rest of your evening. Oh, Brother Michael Ross, I knew you were there. Good to see you, my brother. Um, Have a great day tomorrow. Look forward to being with you tomorrow night at 7.30. Until then, God bless. Goodbye for now.